Hey everyone, welcome back. In this video, I'm testing the 18 sound ND1 TP one inch compression driver along with the 18 sound XT120 horn. And so this caught my eye while I was browsing uh, for a suitable driver for a DIY plan set using the eight inch Purify. And so um, that project can be seen here. It's been quite a long development trying to uh, come up with a off the shelf horn driver comp combination that's workable with the eight, eight inch Purify. And so um, in this video, I'm gonna do a full test on this to see if its performance matches uh, even just the published data, which actually looks quite good. And so you can see here, this is what 18 sound publishes. It has a bit of a falling response, which is quite common, but you don't see any of the typical breakup in the upper treble, uh, neither do you in the impedance uh, sweep there where you see the breakup occurring very high at around 17 kilohertz. Um, also, it's very well behaved, a bit of a, a blip uh, there at 1.6 kilohertz, but otherwise um, looks like it's similar to the RCF ND350 and also the CD350 and so um, thought well let's give it a try um, perhaps it's good and so even looking at the off-axis colored polar map from 18 sound you can see here that it has great pattern control starting at around one kilohertz a uh, little bit of narrowing there at the two kilohertz region but then it's basically wide constant directivity uh, characteristic with some narrowing in the very high upper treble. Okay, um, so for my test setup, because this is going to be uh, potentially used in the 1736 project, um, I've mounted it in the same shape, uh, 30 centimeters wide test baffle just to replicate um, the, at the time, the speaker design that I had. Um, and so starting with the impedance sweep here, this is my measurement. The uh, FS of the driver is closely matched to published, which is at 841 hertz. Um, it's also another reason why I wanted to look at this driver is because I do need to get the crossover quite low, down to about one kilohertz, and also have low distortion. And so, um, so we do, it's good to see. Oftentimes, the FS is quite a bit higher than published, um, but we do see elevated peaks um, at one kilohertz and at 1.6 kilohertz, which uh, shows up in the published data as a much smaller bump and so um, now that might be just my vertical scale which is 30 ohm uh, they're showing it at 50 ohm but I feel as though even despite that that um, they might have been using some smoothing which is a little bit alarming uh, especially for an impedance sweep so let's continue um, Looking at the frequency response here, you can see uh, that it's quite unusual actually. We have a very broad Q peak centered at around three and a half kilohertz, and then it shelves down at five kilohertz, about six dB. Um, also, there's a rise uh, near the horn cutoff. Um, so yeah, this is gonna be really difficult to correct uh, with a passive crossover um, if it was like a gentle falling slope or you know a, a high Q peak we could possibly just notch that out but this is very difficult to deal with almost impossible and almost right off the hop completely rules it out for a passive crossover unfortunately um, looking at the off-axis colored polar map we can see that we have pattern control starting at 2 kilohertz um, the published data said that it was one, um, so I'm not sure why that is the case here. We have significant narrowing of the directivity uh, centered around three kilohertz, where it actually narrows to, an on to only 60 degree listening window. Uh, it then widens again at five kilohertz and provides wide coverage, uh, 90 degree listening window, which is published. Um, up to about nine kilohertz where it gradually starts to narrow down to a 60 degree uh, listening window at around uh, about uh, 16 kilohertz. And so this isn't constant directivity by definition. It's, um, you know, maybe maintaining uh, some control in that five to nine kilohertz region, but the narrowing there uh, may be partially attributable to the 30 centimeter wide baffle, but because we're trying to use this in a real life scenario, um, it's unfortunate to see that we're not getting 
uh, consistent off-axis. And so um, I think at this stage alone, I uh, can conclude that this, this uh, horn driver combination isn't suitable. Especially when looking at the waterfall off-axis chart, um, you can see how inconsistent it is. Um, now, I decided to just compare, just for comparison's sake, um, the ES uh, Circular Horn 1689. You can see here the off-axis colored polar map by comparison is uh, very well behaved. It does have a gradual narrowing, uh, which is typical of exponential horns. And then the waterfall plot that's clearly showing um, quite a contrast with the XT120 horn. Now, to just kind of identify where these issues are coming from, I decided to mount the ND1TP compression driver to the 1869 horn just to identify, um, you know, if the horn was culprit or the compression driver. And so we do see things clean up quite a bit on the ES circular horn, uh, where we, but we do still see that 6 dB shelf uh, at 5 kilohertz. So that's something that's inherent in the driver uh, and not the horn. Now if we do an overlay uh, between the XT120 horn and then the ES circular horn, we can see that the horn is introducing this dip uh, at, sorry, the XT120 horn in red is introducing this dip at 2 kilohertz and it's also aggravating that that bump there centered at three and a half kilohertz um, and then we see things kind of uh, much more similar in the upper treble between the two horns now for further testing i decided to introduce a notch uh, at three and a half kilohertz just for the time domain and distortion measurements just so that we have a flat response or somewhat flat response uh, to be able to further kind of see where things lie with the other uh, set of measurements. And so you can see here, this is the sample to sample matchup between the two drivers that I purchased. And so you can see that they are consistent uh, between the two drivers, which shows, uh, does suggest that um, that my driver, that there's nothing wrong uh, with the drivers that I bought. So now Burst Decay looks relatively clean. It doesn't have any uh, serious resonances. You can see here the, the CSD plot that it has very fast decay. Um, and then you can see that there uh, is some breakup occurring in the upper, upper treble. Uh, so it is uh, well behaved in the time domain. And then you do see the, the FS of the driver uh, clearly being shown, which is very common uh, for any driver to see that in a CSD plot. Um, harmonic distortion uh, remains low and it doesn't really reveal any kind of shortcoming of the driver and so uh, at the 95 dB test signal we see second harmonic at only 0.2% which is quite good. Um, looking at the intermodulation distortion uh, we see kind of a rising noise profile which is also very common and so we can see here if we increase the test SPL to 95 dB um, we're generally around the minus 50 dB for dynamic range so the noise floor is 50 dB down and so that's about 10 dB shy of our target normally I try to target about 60 dB IMD um, at this test signal level so um, so overall, I was disappointed with the overall result, and so um, especially uh, striking comparison would be in a recent test that I had done with a $13 tweeter. Uh, let me just quickly scroll uh, to that. You can see here, um, this is the, the IMD performance on a $13 tweeter uh, mounted to a circular ES horn, and so you can see here at the 85 dB, um, it's at minus 73 and so um, our target for the for this is minus 70 uh, with the 85 dB test signal and so you can see here that the IMD is is excellent on this tweeter um, just kind of further highlights uh, what is available uh, regardless of cost <laughs> um, so yeah so this is the plan at the time that I had published the blog um, now I do have I'm just going to switch over uh, to my to my webcam and I'll show you I, I built a pair of test cabinets oh. <laughs> okay um, so you can see it there uh, so it's a one inch thick Baltic perch cabinet and it's a 40 liter tuned to 30 Hertz and so I'm used, just using the the ES uh, 800 horn on this uh, just for uh, listening in that just to evaluate the uh, the driver I, I hope not to have to use the ES 800 in the plans um, just because I want to be able to offer 
something that's off the shelf. Um, so it may be that I need to offer a 3D printed horn solution. That might be the way to go. I, I now have a number of suppliers for 3D printing um, where I think I might be able to offer. So this is uh, another example of a horn that can be uh, 3D printed. And so this was another uh, feature in a, fu a future video. It's a one inch 25 millimeter dome tweeter. It's aluminum and uh, trying to see the trick with this is getting down uh, to a one kilohertz crossover point. And so what I've found with the Purify at least is that it becomes very obvious if there's distortion uh, coming from the high frequency driver in that one to two kilohertz region, mainly because the distortion is so low on the Purify that any kind of distortion in other parts of the frequency bandwidth becomes very obvious. And so trying to find a high frequency solution that has similar uh, low distortion performance as the Purify, which it does. The Purify is the lowest distortion driver that I've tested to date, um, regardless of uh, the physical size of the driver. Even uh, really uh, good 15 inch drivers seems to have trouble achieving the distortion numbers that we're seeing with the, the eight inch Purify. And so. Um, so yeah, it's just a bit of a journey, a bit of a challenge, uh, trying to match, come up with uh, a high frequency solution. Now I do know that Purify has uh, something in the works themselves, which is something I might want to look at. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's it for today. Uh, take care and have a great day.